First, a quick announcement. Um, tomorrow morning at uh, 9 o'clock, um, I think Christoph would like to take a picture of all of us by the... Um, uh, this this um, statue down there, yes. at the steps close to the bridge. Yeah. And in the afternoon, the light is perfect, like uh, quarter past three, that's what I was like. Sorry, quarter past three, yeah, not <laughs> 9 o'clock. <laughs> That would be funny. Uh, so quarter past three, we'll announce it again tomorrow. Um, and another announcement is um, for those who've, for those who've um, attended four courses um, of the new Austrian school, um, they'll be allowed to submit. Uh, you'll be allowed to submit um, a a paper for either a bachelor degree or a master degree. Um, and the cost of um, the cost of reading this will be um, about 200 euros. Um, it would be exactly, two, but that covers everything, including the, the certificate and. Uh, that's it. All okay. right. So it doesn't have to be. Um, it's non-refundable. <laughs> so you have to pay it, and you might not get the degree. Uh, so that 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 is it. Does it doesn't have to be original? Um, sorry, it has to be original. Um, it doesn't need to be um, something new. It can be something to do um, anything to do with what you've learnt in the course. Um, anything to do with the new Austrian school. And the guideline is circa ten pages sort of for the bachelor's degree, and 15 pages. Could be longer, could be shorter. Exactly. So it's played by the ear. It's uh, not uh, carved into stone, but just to give you some idea, it's around 10 pages for the bachelor, a little longer for the master's degree, and uh, you are running a risk that you might want the master's degree and you'll get only a bachelor's degree. There, there is, I mean, uh, I will have to judge uh, again, what kind of submissions we are getting and if they are high quality then I would say we uh, high quality submissions then I would have to raise the standard because I <coughs> make a distinction. But the main thing is that one of the four courses could be the one at the time you would like to get your degree. So for instance if you have all, all, already three courses done and you want to come back in August, then uh, August could be counted as the fourth. Okay, but you write your thesis before. There will be a deadline for submitting the thesis and let's say uh, it would be July the 1st okay. for the next one or the following year about uh, two months before the course starts so that I will have a chance to read them. Okay. And of course there's also the PhD but there we uh, expect some... Something original. new. Something, something uh, completely... Or elaborating on something which is not fully elaborated on in the lectures. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think uh, comments or questions on the back of... Oh, uh, yeah. On, on this, yes. If you have if any, there any questions, questions on, on this. this. We are going to make a written announcement to the same effect. Uh, is Ludwig here? No. Oh, Willy is here. Okay. Willy, we'll, we'll uh, write down this and circulate it and there you can put it on the, on the website as well. So those who are not here, they will know. And that's the... So Ludwig will submit it to... Now, uh, for your information, we also give... We should give your email address for this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, A. E. Fekater at hotmail <coughs> dot com.
Yeah, what else was I going to say? Mm. Yes, uh, we are also granting honorary degrees, but that's by invitation. So it's not something you apply for, it's by invitation. And our first uh, honorary uh, graduate is going to be Rudy, who has been with us from day one. He was already at the very first, I don't know how many years ago it was, but Rudy has been very faithful, and he also contributed, he was lecturing, he was helping in every way, and as a uh, recognition of his contribution, uh, we are going to grant him at this session. In fact, what day is it? Uh, I think it's Friday. The Friday. Tuesday to be announced. Yeah. Just announced it. And, <laughs> and uh, Rudy will have a uh, little acceptance speech, I suppose, and also give a little talk on a choice which on a topic which should be of interest to all of us. I don't know what it is, but I trust him that he will keep us uh, <laughs> I guarantee you it will be pertinent to this group, to the gold standard, and to us, new Australian economics, and tying it into the world situation today. So, mm. yeah, that's mm. what it's going to be. So, uh, other than that, there will be no other degree at this <coughs> session. In August, we expect to give a, a PhD, one. There are two candidates, but the, it hasn't been decided because the uh, thesis they have submitted is presently in the hands of an external examiner. Uh, by the way, I promised to give you the name of this external examiner. His name is uh, Juan uh, Rayo. Uh, he is a professor at the uh, Royal Carlos University in Madrid. Do, do you uh, do you know him? You know him. He worked with me. Oh, really? <laughs> well, how do you spell the last name? Uh, Juan. Juan. His middle name is Ramon. Ramon. Yeah. He's a he's a good friend of our effort here. He's very familiar. I just I just wanted to say that if you warn me that you sent your uh, thesis to Antar. It, it would be good that, that you warn me on, on my email address that I put down, but not send it was. Sepes Mari, seventeen seventeen at gmail.com okay. So uh, there will be one PhD granted in August and another one in a year from now. Now the, the I limit the number of PhDs to one per session. I decided that it's not a good policy to give two PhDs at the same time. So one of the things Juan Rayo is doing is uh, deciding who is going to be the first one of the two submissions we already have. But we can give, uh, we can grant bachelor's degrees in August and master's degree. So the field is open for anything below the PhD. 
the next session in August and the year from today. Or any time when you feel you are ready, please uh, think about it and just send your uh, paper and we'll be very happy to consider it. Reading. Point of interest, this professor Juan is translating my book uh -huh. into Spanish. That's what Chris just told me. He's translating the book, he's a young music book. Excellent. Wild, so uh, I hope it does a faster job on this judgment that is taken on my book. <laughs> okay. So, um, what, what, what should we do? All right. Now, uh, if no more questions, then uh, I would like to uh, sum it up a little bit. In fact, the next uh, lecture, lecture six, in your uh, in your uh, how do you call this printout, lecture six, the disequilibrium theory of the formation of interest. So that's what we are doing here. That's what we have more or less completed. We approach the subject the same way as Karl Menger did uh, in the case of the theory of price. We approach the uh, subject of theory of interest in the same way, using the same methodology. We come up, instead of one, monolithic interest rate, we come up with two, the floor and the ceiling, and we study separately what forces are at play in <coughs> forming the floor and the ceiling, which is the right approach. You cannot just to study the single monolithic interest because there is no such thing. There are these two things, the floor and the ceiling. We have criticized Aristotle, we have criticized <laughs> St. Thomas of Aquinas, uh, and we have criticized Mises, and uh, this is a long, long history, one of the big unfinished business in the history of economics. And I would like to believe that we have brought it to a very happy conclusion. And the peace is declared between the rival factions, the time preference school and the uh, uh, productivity school. So uh, this is... Uh, one of the big chapters in the economics which I have been trying to develop. And there is another one which is even more challenging. Challenging as this is, even more challenging is the other type of credit which we have uh, to study. This chapter, or this course, as a matter of fact, is devoted to credit as it arises out of saving. That's the broad context into which I uh, would like to put this course. Now, that's only part of the <coughs> more general theory of credit. I already mentioned this, I mention it again, and this is not our subject here, but it's a subject to another course. Uh, we have already lectured on this uh, at least one occasion, maybe two, but uh, we are going to do it again in the future. And this is credit as it arises out of Consumption. 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 <laughs> and this is, as I say, even more challenging in a way because there's more, more controversy about it. A lot of people will deny that there is such a thing, that the source of interest is twofold. Savings on the one hand, consumption on the other. They just deny it, even, among other people, 
Mises uh, denied that, and, and a lot of other people, and they dismiss uh, uh, Adam Smith's real Bill's doctrine. They dismiss it. They just they don't like to attack the person of Adam Smith for very good reasons, because Adam Smith has a, an established reputation. He's one of the great names in the history of economics. So they attack the ideas. They don't attack the man. They find scapegoats like myself when it comes to attacking. But I have thick skin and I can take it, so I don't mind. But I would like to see an open debate where everybody without, without fear and favor could express his or her opinion on the subject and there would be a discussion and uh, we could approach the truth this way. And my uh, efforts to organize such a thing have, uh, have failed. And uh, maybe in Spain we can have that. Uh, a very good man, and I know him in person, I, I admire him. Uh, Jesus Huerta Soto uh, is uh, also very critical of the real Bill's doctrine. Yes. I would love to have an open debate with him. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Hopeless? Yes. Uh, 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 you see what, what I'm up against? <laughs> and the same thing with the Ludwig from Jesus Institute in the United States. You know. Well, uh, you have to ask them. <laughs> I, I did what I could, and I am still trying. I'm uh, issuing challenges. I'm, uh, the, in fact, this uh, paper, with the very latest paper, uh, I yeah. have done before this course, and we are discussing it that, um, the gold problem revisited, which is uh, which starts with Mises' original article in 1965, and I addressed the same four points. I issued this, and I uh, issued this as an answer to Dr. Joe Salerno. He is now the, uh, I think, Vice President or President of uh, Academic Affairs at the Ludwig von Mises Institute in the United States. And I sent it to him and I send, and I'm sending it to various other uh, prominent figures in the Ludwig von Mises Institute and I'm in a way challenging them to uh, have an open discussion on this. I'm not attacking Mises. It's very far from me. I'm an admirer of Mises, and actually I believe that if Mises was alive, he would take me very, very seriously, and he would sit down and uh, talk about it, not like these uh, present representatives. So I can't answer that. You have to ask them. But I'm still trying, and uh, hopefully, there will be some, uh, at some point in the future, there will be a discussion, but so far we haven't succeeded. So I think I'm not going to uh, lecture on the disequilibrium theory of the formation of interest because we have said enough. And in any case, there are three pages in your book which you could read, and if you have any questions, of course, you should feel free to bring them up at any time. Because we have a full plate. We have started discussing this submission to the Wolfson contest, and I am still going to return to that paper, uh, The Gold Problem Revisited. I am going to continue this. So let's consider that with uh, today we have more or less finished this subject 
the um, theory of interest as uh, in the spirit of Karl Menger using his methodology and the two sides of it, the uh, marginal time preference and the marginal productivity of capital, the two together bring about a range within which the rate of interest would vary, the marginal uh, time preference determines the floor and the marginal productivity of capital determines the uh, ceiling of the range within which the interest rate may vary and how these are formed and you can fit in uh, all the problems related to interest into that in that framework. Well, I'm very confident that, uh, I'm not saying it's complete, far from it, but certainly the foundations have been laid. And then you can build on it and fill in whatever gaps there still are. So as I say with this, we consider lecture six done. And then tomorrow I'm going to continue with a new topic. So let's see if there are any questions <coughs> or comments or criticism. Questions, comments, criticisms. Mm. Well, if there's nothing, I would bring up the um, statistics I've seen yesterday on Zero Edge, mm -hmm. uh, which is two chart, uh, two. Well, the median net worth of below 35-year-olds and above 65-year-olds, it fits a bit to the wage fund. So, I bring mm -hmm. this up. In 1984, it was $12,000 median net worth for a below 35-year-old. And in 2009, 24 years later, it was only a third of that, 3500 And the above 65-year-olds, their median net worth has grown from 120,000 in 84 to 170,000 in 2009, which was at the low of the stock market. So I guess this is probably mm -hmm. half more. So the gap between young and old is also very much getting wider. Getting wider because because the young are dependent <coughs> on on wages, and mm. this is the point that is left out the first. So I thought that was a very Mm. Interesting statistics. Excellent. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. um, what, what does a uh, falling interest rate do to your depreciation quota schedule? Hmm. Very good question. It d deserves a close study, detailed study. But off the cuff, I would say the change of interest changes capital values. Just like it changes the bond price, right? So if the uh, interest rate is falling, then the bond price is rising. And what does that mean in terms of capital values? Well, there is a competition between bonds and productive enterprise, productive equipment and so on. So if the uh, rate of interest is falling, how, how would you? I, I would say that your, your, your depreciation, whatever you're doing, will be um, not sufficient. Not sufficient. Not sufficient. So you, you underestimate the need for depreciating. Yes. You have to change your depreciation schedule for a faster yes. one. Yes. Now, is it true in the other case when interest rate 
rises and the bond price falls, then it is possible to relax and say, all right, now we had too tight of a too tight a schedule mm -hmm. so far, and it, uh, and and therefore we might just relax it a little bit. That's also true. Yes, I, it looks looks uh, acceptable mm -hmm. and promising, but now you have to sit down and work out the details. <laughs> Did everybody follow this? <laughs> the depreciation schedule, every piece of equipment has a, a, a life, a, a useful life, say 20 years after which it's going to be scrapped. And then, this has a value, and you estimate what will be the replacement cost 20 years from now. And you come up with a number. And then, you want to write off this value to zero over 20 years, and put aside so much money every year, you as the entrepreneur put aside money uh, which will in 20 years reach that value, uh, that sum of money which you will have to spend to buy the replacement. Okay, So there is this depreciation schedule and uh, it should be clear without too much explanation that, that the variation in the rate of interest will have an effect on these depreciation schedules. So everything, every piece of equipment, every plant, every, uh, every factor of production will be influenced. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why the gold standard is such a valuable instrument because it keeps the rate of interest fairly stable. In fact, it confines it to a very narrow uh, range because any great upheaval in the rate of interest will have all this, uh, these effects. Every single depreciation schedule will be upset some way or another. And that's, uh, that's not helpful. A lot of people <coughs> don't care, a lot of entrepreneurs don't care to rewrite their depreciation schedules. And a lot of them uh, cannot uh, provide the extra money which it might take to write off uh, faster the uh, uh, depreciate the value of each piece of equipment faster and therefore the, the, the more mistakes will be made by entrepreneurs and of course the losses of entrepreneurs are also losses of society because uh, society suffers the consequences if the flow of goods is becomes uh, uh, what's the word uh, 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 yeah it, it, uh, there will be stumbling blocks there will be uh, either surplus or deficit or something not even not sufficiently even. So uh, the gold standard, one of the great merits of the gold standard is that it keeps the rate of interest within a narrow range. It's fairly stable, as stable as it is practically possible. What is not possible, and the gold standard doesn't say that it is trying to do that, is stabilize the price level. It's neither desirable nor possible to stabilize the price level. Because the price itself is a signal, it's an economic signal. That it, uh, you know, certain types of goods are... Uh, 
if they go up in price, then you have to uh, worry about that, or they fall in price uh, precipitously. So this is a signal to the producer and to the distributor that they should do something. And if they are good, if they are worth their salt, then they will act and try to counter this, this price signal gives them a message and they read the message and act and put certain uh, remedial action into uh, place. So this is a f completely false idea to say that the gold stand like uh, Bernanke, he says something about uh, that the good prices were not stable under the gold standard or they were uh, <coughs> they, uh, they, uh, the prices uh, over the short or long or medium term that changed too much because this is not the job of the gold standard to stabilize prices but just compare the history of the gold standard with the history of the prices ever since the Federal Reserve uh, system was established in the United States in 1913. I mean, it, it just uh, boggles the mind, the loss of stability and the crazy moves of prices back and forth. Let me just quote one example because I, so I, uh, perhaps most of you weren't around, but I was, 1970, uh, late 70s, 1979. The price of sugar for a long, long time was in the order, there were two prices of sugar in the United States, domestic and imported. And they, of course, imported uh, uh, cane. Sugar cane. Sugar cane. Well, cane sugar. Mm. Uh, sugar made out of cane, uh, which came from Latin America, in, in Cuba in particular, but lots of other places. And they were very, this was very cheap. Labor was cheap. And cane is. Uh, like a weed, it just grows if the climatic conditions are right. Um, price of sugar was less than two cents a pound for a long, long time. That's imported sugar. And then, of course, they had the quota system because they uh, tried to protect the domestic uh, sugar producers. That was mostly beet, beet sugar, not cane sugar, but uh, and, and it cost more to produce higher labels and so. But uh, the sugar price was regulated, and and the government had a, a large role to play in this, and it was also like giving out goodies. So if the government behaved, uh, then they got a larger quota, they could export more sugar to the United States. So Cuba uh, could be punished when it went communist because the sugar quota was abolished and uh, Cuba was drowning in its own sugar. Uh, but other countries were rewarded and they got big quotas and so on. But the point is that even though this was highly regulated and uh, the sugar price was controlled, but it was uh, fairly stable in comparison. Now believe it or not, in 1978 or 9, the sugar price went from well, not in one step, but over a short space of time, went all the way to 75 cents a pound. It's just an incredible increase. Now, it shows the complete incompetence of governments and central banks and so on. Because this was not because of uh, some properties of sugar being too uh, 
too scarce or too abundant because the sugar production is fairly even. This was a failure of the monetary system. But you were not allowed to say that because the monetary system was about criticism. It's the Federal Reserve. You can't blame that for the high cost of sugar. But believe it or not, that is... And by the way, I have lived through also World War II. I was a teenager, but I remember very well that sugar was one of the stuff, one of the things which uh, people hoarded. The sugar doesn't spoil. You put them in bottle or tight uh, bags or something. You can store it nicely. It keeps and keeps and keeps. And in a war situation, uh, when there are all kinds of shortages, there is a black market for sugar. And then your hoarded sugar could be sold. And that was a type of saving. Of course, people would have saved gold if they had access to it, but uh, by that time, 1939, 1940, there was no way in Hungary where I lived uh, to uh, buy gold. It was all controlled by the central bank. But you, uh, housewives could, could uh, hoard sugar, and they did. And there were a lot of things they could hoard. They could hoard coffee, tea, spices, very common, alcohol, and so on. And uh, I'm mentioning this because I want to put this into context. Sugar is a very special commodity because it, it's a useful commodity for hoarding purposes. Uh, it's a hoardable commodity, not as hoardable as gold or silver or some metals, but it is still highly hoardable and easily available, and you can store them safely and when the time comes. Now, of course, in Hungary they had to have strict laws against hoarding sugar, and they did. And there were raids. Police came and searched the pantry of housewives for hoarded sugar. And if you were caught with more than two or three uh, pounds of sugar, well, maybe five pounds, I don't remember, of course, then you were charged. There were laws against having more sugar than uh, thought reasonable by the government. Incredible, but that is true. So, uh, to give you this example, I remember very well. And of course, everybody knows the story about the price of crude oil, which uh, started from something like two or three dollars a barrel in, in the 70s. But after Nixon they say close the gold window because you are not supposed to say Nixon defaulted mm. on the gold obligations, of the international gold obligations of the United States. And that put the uh, oil price on the skid, just like it put the price of sugar on the skid, exploding. And there were many other commodities. And uh, what was the uh, maximum which the crude oil went to in, uh, in the immediate aftermath of, of um, the 1971? Was it $30 a barrel? Something in that area. Maybe a little more, I don't remember. But that's more than tenfold. You see, in the case of sugar, it's much more than tenfold. And you see, this is a disease of the monetary system. There were plenty of oil, and they had to invent uh, the conspiracy of oil shikes and uh, all kinds of ad hoc uh, explanation why oil, the oil price went uh, out of control. 
you see. But this is this was all false because the real thing was the trouble with money. But you were not supposed to say that. You were not supposed. And of course, if you wrote a book on that, you can be sure that you won't uh, wouldn't find a publisher who would take the risk in publishing <coughs> on um, why high oil price, why high sugar price. Is there any justification for that, or what is the real justification? Uh, Willie, um, I think mean, this uh, it's quite interesting. So I mean, um, um, the historical um, ratio of how many um, barrel, oil, uh, barrel oil you can um, purchase with one ounce of gold. Mm. You know this mm. chart? Mm. So I think that's very interesting. So um, if you say some words. No, I, I can't. Rem I don't know the shape of the chart. You don't? Know? No. Okay, so um, I just saw it uh, on the presentation two weeks ago.